an incredibly rare hybrid solar eclipse. We have the first significant meteor shower of the year with the Lyrids. Mercury reaches greatest elongation. Venus passes by Pleiades. We also have the pink Pascal moon to look forward to. Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for April 2023 and make sure you stick around to the end of the video so you can find out how you can win a copy of my monstrous book photographing the night sky. Now full moon this month is on April the 6th and it's the pink moon in the Native American cultures and it's sadly nothing to do with the color of the moon itself. It's simply because this moon coincides with the blooming of the Phlox subulata flower in North America. To Christians it's known as the Pascal moon which is the first full moon after the March equinox and it also marks the date when Easter will occur so Easter falls on the Sunday after the first full moon which occurs on or after the March equinox so Easter this year will be on the 9th. Now with full moon being on the 6th if you want to do some Milky Way photography this month you're better off doing it during the latter half of the month so for those of you in the northern hemisphere the Milky Way core will rise in the east southeast in the early hours of the morning and it will climb higher towards the south as we approach the morning twilight. It's also a good time of year still to get a Milky Way arch panorama. So facing east, you'll have the Milky Way core in the southeast, the Great Rift arching over to the Cygnus region and down to the fainter Cassiopeia region in the northeast. For those in the southern hemisphere, there's actually two good opportunities for a Milky Way arch panorama. The first is in the evening as darkness falls facing west. You'll have the southern hemisphere section of the Milky Way in the south, the normal region, and then the fainter section that runs through the constellations Gemini, Orion, and Auriga in the northwest. Then the Milky Way core will start to rise in the late evening, and by midnight it should be fully above the horizon. And then once it's climbed a bit higher into the sky, there's a second opportunity for the Milky Way arch panorama facing southeast. It's also a good month to spot the most elusive naked eye visible planet, Mercury. It spends the first couple of weeks of the month climbing higher and higher into the evening sky and it reaches greatest elongation on the 11th where it will be 19.5 degrees away from the sun. So because Mercury is closer to the sun than us here on Earth, Mercury is never too far away from the sun in the sky. So during this greatest elongation is the, the furthest it will be from the sun in the sky for this half of the orbit. And this elongation occurs at a time of year where the ecliptic, the path that all the planets follow in the night sky, the ecliptic is very steep against the horizon. And so because Mercury is as far away from the sun as it typically can be, and the ecliptic is very steep against the horizon, Mercury will be considerably high above the horizon. It's probably the best opportunity of the entire year to spot Mercury, especially for those in mid to high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. On the same evening that Mercury reaches greatest elongation, Venus will make its closest approach to Pleiades, the open star cluster, also known as the Seven Sisters. And it will be close to Pleiades for a couple of days before the 11th and after the 11th as well. So if you don't get to see it on the 11th, there's still a good opportunity to get Venus and Pleiades together in the same photo in the days before and after. Venus will spend all of the month as an evening star and it will climb higher and higher into the western evening skies as the month goes by. On the 23rd, it's joined by a crescent moon. Further along the ecliptic above Venus, you'll find the planet Mars, slowly making its way through the constellation Gemini this month. It's joined by a crescent moon on the 25th. Jupiter is lost behind the sun, so we don't get to see it this month. But as the month goes by, Saturn will start to appear in the morning twilight. It's joined by a crescent moon on the morning of the 16th. 
Then on April the 20th is a really rare event known as a hybrid solar eclipse, where for some people they will get to see a total solar eclipse where the moon completely covers the sun from view. But then other people further along the path of maximum eclipse will only see an annular solar eclipse where the moon is not close enough to Earth to completely cover the sun from view, and you end up with a ring of fire around the moon in the sky. The thin corridor of the maximum eclipse will pass through the Ningaloo coast of Western Australia where it will appear total and then stretch through West Papua province in Indonesia and sweep across the islands of Micronesia where the eclipse becomes annular. The eclipse ends out in the Pacific Ocean about 1900 miles east of the Hawaiian Islands. Only a small number of people will be able to enjoy maximum eclipse but for a much larger region there will be a partial eclipse and this includes people across all of Indonesia, Australia and Papua New Guinea as well as several other areas in the Western Pacific. April also brings us one of the first significant meteor showers of the year, the Lyrid Meteor Shower. It's active from around the 15th until the end of the month, but it will peak on the night of the 22nd into the morning of the 23rd, where a crescent moon will set in the late evening, meaning viewing conditions are pretty perfect. The radiant point of the meteor shower is in the constellation Lyra, which for those in the northern hemisphere rises into the northeast in the late evening and continues to climb higher into the east as we approach the morning twilight. The higher the radiant point is in the sky, the more likely you are to see meteors, and during the peak it maxes out at about 18 meteors per hour. Remember though, you don't have to look in the direction of the radiant point. If the radiant point's in the sky, meteors are going to fall all over the sky, just that if you trace a line backwards from where the meteors streak, they all point towards the same point in the night sky, the radiant point. Now, as the radiant point has quite a positive declination, it is best viewed in the northern hemisphere. If you are in the southern hemisphere, your best bet is to face north in the pre-dawn hours and hope you can see some meteors over the horizon. And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Here's a quick summary of all the events. Let me know which ones you're most looking forward to in the comments down below. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload your images to social media using the hashtag Wittens. I then pick my favorite three for a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky hoodie. And first place wins a copy of my book, Photographing the Night Sky. Last month, I asked you guys to photograph the zodiacal light. And when I've done it in the past, I didn't get many entries, but this time around, I really struggled to pick some winners. And I was really surprised that people were making the zodiacal light the main subject in the image. So in third place was Marina with this image captured from Gran Canaria with the zodiacal light and Venus glowing above Tenerife in the distance there. Real nice cloud inversion going on above the clouds in a really nice little forest up on the hills and uh, yeah, just really loved the way this was naturally processed and just enjoyed the overall feel of the image. In second place was William with this image from the Red Cliffs at Red Rock Canyon State Park in California. Again, really nicely processed and I just love the impressive rock formations in the foreground. And again, just a really nice, naturally processed image and uh, just really feel like you're there yourself out under the stars. And in first place was Andrea with this image from Moran's Curve. I just love that sweeping foreground, the snowy peaks under this really cool blue sky, the zodiacal light dominating the image and uh, taking on the Milky Way, as it were. You can just about see Venus there setting behind the mountain as well. I just really love the composition of this image and the artistic choice of the cool white balance and um, some nice hydrogen alpha data there as well. This month let's go with moon and planets. So images with the moon and at least one other planet. So let's see what you guys can do. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Hit subscribe if you haven't already and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.